Hello, welcome to Convergent Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I am talking with Adrian Goldsworthy. Adrian is a teacher and lecturer and writer on the Roman Empire and Roman history. He's attended Oxford University and he's got a DPhil in ancient history. Uh, he has the thesis of the Roman army as a fighting force, 100 BC to AD 200 is in the uh, Oxford monograph series that remains one of the best-selling works in the series. He a, was a junior research fellow at Cardiff University for two years. He's taught at King's College London. He was an assistant professor on the University of Notre Dame in London's program. Uh, and now he does writing uh, full-time. He's written numerous books, including the most recent, Rome and Persia, The 700-Year Rivalry. Uh, it's absolutely fantastic. I, I still have no idea how he was able to write about 700 years in such a, a concrete, you know, synthesized, um, really, you know, precise way. It's, it's, it's a real uh, feat, what, what he's accomplished in the book, and I, I was really, really happy to, to read it and to talk with him all about that book. We talk about the importance and similarities of studying past empires. We talk about the 700-year rivalry between Rome and Persia. We talk about an overview of the Roman and Persian empires, differences in governing and peaceful coexisting, the critical and complex story of Armenia, which was very fascinating to me, the greatness of Augustus, the Silk Roads, of course, Constantine, Justinian's reign, the Arab armies, and how they quelled uh, the the Roman and Persia rivalry at at the end. Again, it it was such a wonderful uh, conversation to have with Adrian. He is a, a, an encyclopedia of knowledge on the Roman Empire and all the surrounding uh, parts of it. Um, I, I really was um, excited to have him come on and, and talk about it and really get into the details, which we do a lot in the conversation about uh, what it was like in this period between Rome and Persia and how it's how rivalries then didn't. It wasn't just all you know fighting and 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 uh, you know pillaging and things like that. It was. There's a, it's a type of sophisticated aspect to it, and there's a, a lot of diplomacy and administrative kind of reign, which you know is is really really interesting, especially when we think about how we do things in, in current day. So um, it's fantastic. As always, you can listen to this conversation, all of the conversations at Convergent Dialogues at Substack.com. I'm also on YouTube, so go and follow, subscribe, and and uh, share widely with with folks that will be interested. And now I bring you Adrian Goldsworth. I am here with Adrian Goldsworthy. Uh, Adrian, thanks so much for uh, coming on the podcast. I'm uh, looking forward to talking with you. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, of course. Uh, you have written a fantastic uh, book. Uh, it's very ambitious, and uh, it definitely meets the mark. I'll say that. So it's called Rome and Persia, the 700-Year Rivalry, and um, it's, uh, it's quite epic in some ways. I have to say, it's a, you cover so much ground. Uh, so before we get into it, just tell listeners uh, who you are uh, in terms of professionally, academically, and uh, what you're currently up to. Well, I started out as a ancient historian at Oxford and then did my doctorate on the Roman army and then did the usual university thing of teaching for a few years and writing the academic articles where you're pretty sure that during the course of your life, you'll meet everybody who's actually read the thing <laughs> because it's <laughs> it's very niche, it's very specialist. And mm-hmm. then I was lucky enough, people started asking me to write popular books. So, mm-hmm. um, and I've gone on from that looking at a different period. So this one, this is getting frightfully modern for me, getting us into the seventh century. <laughs> from, you know, <laughs> My background is in late Republic, early empire. I've sometimes gone earlier, I've sometimes gone later, but this was but this, so um, now I just write for a living and um, have a lot of fun doing that because it means you can deal with big topics like this mm. in a way that if you're writing for solely for other scholars, then you have to get into so many of the minor controversies in great detail and reference everything and go through absolutely everything that you, you can't look at very often, very easily at the big picture mm-hmm. and some of the bigger questions. And there's a lot to be said for that because it's... Um, 
it gives you perspective and you sometimes realize some of the nice theories don't work too well when you look and say, well, actually, this has been going on pretty much the same way for hundreds of years, or how come it lasts so long? <laughs> so um, that's the fun thing. I, I write books now that are the sort of thing I'd like to read, and I just hope other people do as well. So it's it's going back to why I was interested in history from the start when I was was young and looking at those big topics and then hoping that anyone who's interested enough to pick it up can follow what I'm saying and what I'm explaining so that you don't need to have a prior knowledge, although hopefully if you do, you'll see interesting details and a different perspective on things. So it's it's trying to sort of straddle all of those different um, audiences and different markets. But in the end, it's you write a book because you think that would be a good book and there isn't one out there and I'd really like to read it. So I better get mm-hmm. on and do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. It's it's interesting how that works now because I, I what, what you said there is is right is you know, I, I've uh, I was telling somebody this the other day. I have when I was an undergrad, I took uh, you know like a world history class or global civilization class. I took like two or three of them, and I remember just being bored to tears, right? Because it's the usual like you know dates and places and times. And you know, when I was I was quite young when I was an undergrad, I just didn't care. Now that I'm older, I'm like, oh yeah, I kind of like this now. Why didn't I pay attention when I was young? <laughs> You know, so, so then you're looking for like, well, I don't want to go and read textbooks and stuff. So it is really nice to have kind of that like <clears throat> wide lens, big picture idea. And and, and history is interesting to me because, uh, you know, you know, psychology is my world. So, you know, I, this I'm not a historian, although I talk to many historians. And it's just always interesting how you can understand people, different people groups, different places. And, you know, there's obviously differences um, in some ways, but in a lot of ways, you know, people are kind of the same in, yeah. in, in a lot of scenarios and environments. And so learning from history, one of the things I, I, I found interesting recently, with, you know, obviously the Roman Empire, uh, you can talk about, you know, the Mongols, you can talk about Persians, you can talk about uh, the Ottoman Empire. One of these interesting things I've been kind of finding through all of these uh, kind of a running thread is... I think some people forget like how big, the, how how much space and how many people groups uh, folks were kind of governing, if you will, and the administrative kind of fortitude and power to really manage that is extremely impressive. And I that's the thing I've been kind of was very boring administrative kind of thing. But it's it's really interesting. It's like most governments today can't run their countries. Um, and so just to find out you have like hundreds of years of this constancy between and then how we still use things from like the early Roman Empire that have really that we still use in modernity, such as you know, irrigation and you know, fresh water system, all these different things, medicine and philosophy. And it's very interesting to see kind of the the genesis of all of that. And so that's what, that's what I find with, with, with your book uh, and a few others that have been writing about these periods that it's, you can really get the kind of big picture and some of the ways and how we can understand that, you know, and the relevance of it for, for humans today. Well, I think in the end, people are just people and homo sapiens hasn't changed that much. Yes. Different societies, different cultures have attitudes and assumptions that we find really alien, but the thing is, if they weren't essentially like us, we wouldn't be able to study history at all mm. because they would simply be a mystery. But then you could extend that and say, well, anybody today from a different country, a different culture is somehow so different that you can't understand them. And it, it's clearly not true. I mean, it, you can read someone like Cicero in the first century BC and in his letters, the upset he has when his, his adult daughter dies is just a hum- very human emotion. And you could see the same. There's, uh, you know, People often say, well, well, there's such a high mortality rate, especially amongst infants in the ancient world. But if you see some of the tombstones erected to children, and there's one from just south of Hadrian's Wall that has carved on it. It's just like a child's drawing. And you know the way they, they always put in the four fingers and a thumb? Mm. Like, <laughs> because they know that's what you've got. So it's done like that, this little girl holding a ball. And it's listed in the number of years, months, and days this this poor child did. Again, this is parents mourning in a way, trying to understand. But it's clearly a deeply emotional thing. But it, it's it's relatable. It, it is something we can understand. And that's, you know, without getting too too much like Thucydides, the Greek historian just says, well, pe- people are the same and basically the same sort of stuff's going to happen again and again. Mm-hmm. There mm-hmm. is a lot of truth in that. And mm-hmm. there's... Um, 
But it is, as you say, that the scale of it all, particularly when you go back and think of a world without the speed of modern communications, right. you know, and yet you've got, you could look at an archaeological site on Hadrian's Wall and one in Syria in the Roman Empire, and essentially the same goods are available mm -hmm. wherever you are, and people are wearing the same fashions in shoes and doing their hair the same way, and this sort of thing, all within a very short period of time. Yeah, it takes a few years for things to cross the empire, but it does it. Mm -hmm. And then when you consider, as you look at a little bit in the book, you've got goods that are being and people being brought into the Roman Empire, through the Roman Empire, through the Persian Empire, and all the way to China, not necessarily the same people taking them all the way, but this, this communicate, you, you know, the ancient world is pretty big mm -hmm. and yet it still seems to function. Yes. The Chinese and the Romans don't really know enough about each other other than dim awareness of existence, but some people are doing so a lot of people all along this route are gaining from trade. That's connected. That's got a market here to one right the other side of the world. It, it's again, the, the one mistake we, that, you have to be careful in assuming that the Romans, because they seem so modern, are just like us and do things our way. But you also have to avoid the other pitfall, which is to just say, oh, no, they're basically primitive and they're a bit stupid and they're not going to work out. Because these, these different groups, and as you say, like the Mongols and others, they make things work. Mm -hmm. And they don't necessarily do it in exactly the same way we would. But often you find that they do, and they they. But it's it's very practical. You know, these empires are not successful without being pretty good at certain things, mm. however ruthless and um, you know whatever their motives may be, they are efficient. So it's um, it's. I mean, it is just it it is staggering when you you step back and you remind yourself of what it is you're dealing with and what mm. you're looking at. Because again, mm. you you take it for granted and the more you study something, the more you think, well, it's just inevitable. This is going to happen. Mm -hmm. And you yeah. forget all the stages that it took to achieve that and then keep it running. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, in some ways it's even more impressive because mm -hmm. they don't have things like modern medicine and the speed of communication and they don't have, you know, in that way it's, it's, it is more impressive. So, you know, this is kind of just a kind of a context or uh, a backdrop, if you will, for for listeners to kind of, you know, if we get into some of the details and some of this stuff feels very foreign, uh, you know, that's always a kind of good reminder. That's at least how I approach it when I read. It's like, oh, okay, you know, this is this is this is kind of the way in which you can kind of come at it. Okay, so seven hundred years. That's a long time. That is a long time. It's a long span of history. I mean, that's that's uh, what is that more than triple how long you know uh, my country over here on this side of the pond has been around as a as a as a country and <laughs> seven hundred years is a long time. Um, why these seven hundred years? So it's basically just before the first century AD all the way up to seven hundred AD. I definitely want to get to that because it seems like it right in the middle of the uh seven centuries where you have basically the the genesis of islam and that becomes a really interesting player just globally and like historically it's just very very fascinating i've talked to other folks from different angles of that but it, seeing it here kind of getting all of these 700 years and then you're like oh so this is where it kind of things start to shift a bit so we'll, we'll come to that but why these why these 700 years and why is this rivalry of sorts between what we would say is the Persian uh, Empire and the Roman Empire? Why is that important, or why did you choose to kind of focus on that kind of framing? Well, it, it was it was odd because the publisher came to me and asked for a book on just the last century or two and the sort of the end of the rivalry and then mm. how it all ends with the, the rise of Islam. And I, I thought, oh, that's interesting, but it's quite difficult to do. And then the more I thought about it, the more I thought, well, actually. If you're going to understand this, you need to know what's happened before. And it's not, it's not something that even a lot of people who are quite interested in the ancient world and the Roman or the Byzantine period focus on to that extent. They look at little bits of it, but they don't put it all into context. And I, I started to think, well, actually, no one has really looked at this, the meeting of these two empires. And you've got the Roman Empire that is huge, and it's you know, a large part of the known world, a lot significant part of the population of the world, world that even is unknown to most people in, within it, and it lasts for so long. But you've also got this Parthian dynasty and then the Sasanian Persian dynasty that rules another empire that isn't quite as big, but it's still far, far bigger, far more complex, far more sophisticated, far more powerful and successful than anybody else out there that the Romans have, have dealings with. So 
the more I looked, the earlier I was drawn to look. I, I realized that actually the st- the big story is how do, they, do these two empires live alongside each other for so long? Because the eventual brutal conflict that, that nearly bring, well, brings both of them to their knees in the seventh century doesn't just come out of nowhere. Mm. And to understand that, you have to look, why is this so unusual? What have they been doing all this time? And how come both seem to have prospered, even though they fight each other fairly often, how come it still works? It seems to be, and that then brings into to wider themes. You know, there have been big debates in Roman his, history about why the Romans expand and then what are they trying to do when they've got the empire? When they stop expanding, do they still really want to? It's just that they, they don't have the, 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 the might to do it anymore, the wealth to do it anymore, or the will to do it anymore. And yet you, you, once you look at this relationship over a much longer period, you start to realize, well, like, do this... This doesn't work. They do seem to be quite rational, and they think, actually, yes, we're going to fight these people, and we want to always be seen as better than them, yeah. but they're not really that much of a threat. This is never a life and death struggle until arguably that last generation. And up until then, so they, they've dealt with each other differently. So it was, it was just a thought that, again, that's an interesting story, and nobody had told it. Um, even there isn't even an academic study that looks at the whole period, because again, because of this break in dynasty between the Parthians and the Sasanian Persians, scholars tend to go one side or the other, and you'll do a book on one. Or, but it's geographically, it's the same empire. The people who live there are the same people. Many of the noble families just continue on happily all the way through, mm. and you see people with the same name, the same title, right the way through. It, it's it's an artificial thing that partly comes from propaganda of the Sasanian dynasty, but it's also a very convenient modern thing. We break it up into periods so we can separate it, and it means we don't have to study earlier stuff or later stuff, depending on where you go. So that was the the sort of genesis of the idea. And then the more I looked at it, the more it seemed to make sense that you really do have to view all of this and tell the whole story. But it it is big, and it means people have got to cope with major changes on both sides. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people, a lot of places, most of which are not very familiar even to enthusiasts for um, Roman history. Mm, yeah. So obviously, I want people to read the book, and 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 obviously, seven hundred years is 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 tough to kind of uh, get into any detail, and 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 even even if we sat here for three hours, it would just barely scratch the surface. But so I'll try to keep most of this big picture stuff. So I guess setting the stage here, what's the kind of give us the kind of contours of both the Roman Empire and the in the the Persian Empire, the the, the two uh, uh, variants. Uh, including maybe for listeners, the kind of current corresponding countries of where we would see them today on a on a globe or a map. Well, Rome, of course, is you know a place that many people will have visited or will do so at some point. It's it's one of those oddities of history that we've all heard of the Roman Empire, and we know it's a city, and it turns into this you know an empire that has large parts of Europe, North Africa, and and uh, Western Asia, and controls it for centuries. And so there's a you know, Rome probably their myths say they're founded in the eighth century BC. It's probably about right. It's a gradual expansion from being a few villages to a city to being a city dominating other cities. And then by the beginning of the third century BC, they dominate Italy. But they have, if you think of the United States as the, the sort of the epitome of the melting pot of bringing people from all over the world, making a one culture, the Romans have this very strange even more unusual knack of going out and making people Roman. There have been plenty of empires in the world, but the Romans expand and expand their citizen body in a way that no other ancient people does. So they turn, they make Italy Roman, and then they gradually make more and more parts of the empire Roman. So you have an expansion from the big struggle with Carthage, modern-day Tunisia, they win that, they defeat Hannibal, you know, the fellows brought elephants over the Alps, all that sort of thing. And then they, within a, a generation or two, they dominate the Mediterranean world. And the, the big picture in the other side has been Alexander the Great, whom I've written about before this book, which again, this is a sort of almost a sequel to that, mm. who has gone from this northern Greek kingdom and charged the way all the the way across to modern day Pakistan and created this very short lived empire that included all the lands in between. That hasn't lasted. His generals have fought each other from the, the late 4th century BC onwards. A big eastern kingdom, the Seleucid Empire, develops, founded by 
again, one of Alexander's commanders, founds this new dynasty, just as the Ptolemies did in Egypt, they're the ancestors of Cleopatra. That expands, but it doesn't have that much contact with Rome until the Romans start to push east and they, they, they come into it. But even then, it, it's, it's fairly distant. However, the, the Parthians emerge as, first of all, a group that raids into the Seleucid Empire, but then they become the leaders of one of the provinces of the Seleucid Empire, which before that had been part of the, the Persian Empire. And you've got that cycle, really, of, of large powers going back to Babylonians and Medes and Assyrians and but all these. Yeah. Part of that area has a tendency, it, it's, it's got deep roots of cultivation, which have led to civilization. Mm. And there seems to be a tendency for parts of it to come together under one regime more often and earlier than happens, say, in Europe, where things are, are much, much slower developing that sort of complex society. So you end up with the Parthians rebelling. They will eventually overthrow the Seleucids, who are being pressured from the other side, from the West, by the Romans. So by the time the Romans control or dominate at least all the lands around the Mediterranean, the Parthians have basically taken over the old Seleucid Empire. Mm. Now, they are initially, they're nomads from the southern steppes, but they've obviously got more and more support from different people who've lived there, just as the, the Seleucids and Alexander and his Macedonians have, because most of these empires are created by a leader with a relatively small army. And what you do is you go and persuade all the local nobility to change sides and support mm. you, because they've had a king or a great emperor or a king of kings before, and you're just, your loyalty to a different person, who, but who will also protect you when you need it. Mm -hmm. So there's this tradition of central authority that's, you know, the Achaemenid Persians and others revived. The Parthians create this new empire, and they, like the Romans, they are basically both militaristic expansionist empires who have conquered this territory and then try to control it. But they have, because they've come from very different cultures, very different societies, and different landscapes. The heartland of the Parthian and then Persian Empire is really modern-day Iraq and particularly Iran, but expanding into Afghanistan, into the former Soviet Union, Southern Republics, into Syria, down to the Arabian Gulf at various times. It sort of expands and contracts depending on the strength of central authority, whereas the Romans will take... Europe from what's now, or the borders of what's now Scotland to the Sahara Desert, to the Atlantic, into Syria, into Turkey, into that area, up to the Danube in Europe and some, in some areas beyond. Mm. So if you look at those areas, the Romans have got the sort of the wetter bit, effectively. Mm, it's yeah. it's mm. where they get more rain. It's where cultivation is easier, mm. which in some ways means that development's slower, because when you're dealing with systems where you don't get enough rainfall to grow things naturally, you tend to have to organize to irrigate. Mm -hmm. And that encourages the development of authority of these more coherent societies, more centralized. Um, so you've got parts of the Parthian Persian Empire are very mountainous and rugged, and you can't produce much from that. Some of them are semi-desert or desert, also difficult. But others, with controlled use of water, you could make extremely fertile. And in the same way, the Roman Empire is very much an empire of cities. And on the Greco-Roman model, some of the Persian and Parthian Empire is like that. And some of that's to do with cities like Babylon that are far older than all of these invaders, whether it's the Achaemenid Persians or Alexander or the Parthians, whoever, um, and still keep their traditions and their religions and that they're organized. Or we've got the Greek foundations, these, these Greek colonies with relatively few ethnic Greeks and Macedonians, but enough to create a culture of Greek language, Greek law, Greek ideas. You know, there's a, a city they've excavated in northern Afghanistan that, uh, we're not quite in northern Afghanistan anymore, but into um, beyond that, where you've got a Greek theatre, you've got a Greek library, you've got all these things for centuries, and people are living that life, though, again, how many of them look any different from the locals in every other respect is, is very hard to say. But it, So mm. you've got this, this mixture. There, the Roman Empire is extraordinarily varied, but they're probably more uniform compared to the Parthians and the Persians. But they both work in their different ways. They're not trying to, not, neither of them is too rigid. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the, the title of the Parthian and the Persian king is that he is king of kings. Mm -hmm. And that emphasizes it is a patchwork of other kingdoms. 
And mm. often there's a lower level of even local kings beyond the sort of regional ones mm. down below that. So it's it's feudal in a sense, but it's not quite the same as medieval feudalism. It works differently, but it's it's part of you're bringing this together, but you're giving a lot of independence locally because that's the only way it's practical to work. The distances are so huge mm. that you can't rush around and deal with everything. Um, so, and the, the Romans, I mean, a lot of authorities devolved in the Roman Empire as well to cities and to allied kingdoms and this sort of thing. But it, mm. it's it's easier. The Roman Empire also has the advantage sort of sea in the middle. Mm. Yeah. Whereas it, it's sort of, but anyway, that's. Um, yeah. It, it's interesting. I, I guess I'm curious here. So there's a, f- a few things here, but um, you you don't, I don't think you maybe mentioned it as explicitly or, you, you know, you, it's again, you're moving through periods, but. You definitely, at least in the beginning of the book, there's you're you're uh, traversing the time of uh, what many people know as you know Pax Romana, which is a, a kind of the golden age of the Roman Empire, et cetera. And, and um, so maybe we come to some of that. But and I certainly want to come to it's something I've been I've been I've been realizing more recently, um, both historically and in modern times, of the very peculiar story of armenia armenia is becoming more and more fascinating to me because it's extremely complicated as a region and even still currently to today i mean it's it's a very complex place and 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 the reason i bring up armenia is because armenia is legitimately sandwiched between essentially between these two empires um so we can chat about that but before we i guess get to there i guess i want to you, you mentioned that both use military might. You know, the Roman Empire certainly does. Um, and there's many important battles, you know, amongst each other and then, you know, other empires. But how how, how did these two empires in the, I guess, in the early stages, how did they rule differently? And also, how was there a kind of, in different parts uh, of this 700-year period, a peaceful coexistence. So you have these two mighty empires, military strength. So just talk about what were their differences in all this governing? And then also, how do you have these two big juggernauts kind of peacefully coexisting for large periods? I mean, the Roman tradition comes very much from Italy that is not good country for raising horses. You know, you, you, a mule is more valuable than a horse in Italy for most transport and for getting around or for pulling wagons, carts, this sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So you have a development of something that you've had from the Greek side as well of the, the sort of the armored heavy infantryman who fights in close ordered ranks and smashes his way through opposition. And that's the heart of the Roman legion for a lot of the, the period, though it, it will develop later on. So it is very much an army that's designed to go and take ground. And it's very, the Romans have a tendency, the, the Greek historian Polybius writing in the second century BC described the Romans as more inclined than most people to use violent force, bia. This this sense that if they, you know, if you if you hit something with a hammer and it doesn't work, then you get a bigger hammer. There, there is a, a lack of subtlety about many of their foreign relations, this sort of thing. So this is the Roman tradition that develops as their empire develops and eventually their army becomes professional so that the experience and the training can be passed on to the next generation rather than one lot learns, but as soon as they go home, you've got to learn it again. The Parthians come from a different tradition whereby partly it's this, this nature of being king of kings. So your army is going to be made up of contingents of lots of people from different regional kingdoms under their own leaders, their own kings, their own noble families, this sort of thing. It's not like a Roman legion where everybody goes into the Roman army in a, in a sense, you know, and you're all going to expect to fight in the same way. You've also come from this tradition of the Achaemenid Persians before them who were not um, nomadic people. They emphasized cavalry far more than a lot of people in the, in the West. But the steppe tradition of the horse archer, of someone who uses a very powerful composite bow, but he is he fights in a way where ground doesn't really matter because... There's no point dying for a few square miles of step because there's plenty more. You just retreat and wait till you can fight an advantage. So it's not an honor thing. There's no obligation to go toe-to-toe with someone. Um, It's more about winning. So it's whereas at first Westerners sort of see this as a lack of courage, it's not. It's just a different concept of fighting. You wear the enemy down till they're weak, then you destroy them. 
rather than fighting on their terms. So they have this army, but they also have this mixture of the, you know, the classic image of the Parthian is the, the horse archer. And you get the expression, the Parthian shot, because not only can they shoot at you and lob arrows when they're coming towards you, but they can also turn around mm -hmm. and shoot behind as they're retreating, which is, it, it sort of confuses Greco-Roman perceptions of what war should be about. That you, somebody could be running away and still kill you. It's, it just doesn't seem right somehow to them. They have this, and it, it's, the horse archer is the, the sort of the epitome of the Parthians as far as the Romans are concerned. The Sasanian Persians, they think more of the armoured cavalrymen, the cataphract. That is something the Parthians also use as well. But we have to be careful because one big problem in writing a book like this is that there are so few sources that tell you the detail you really want. Mm -hmm. You know, you're very limited at, altogether from the Parthian and um, slightly lesser, but still the Sasanian Persian side. But even the Roman accounts aren't anywhere near as good as we'd like them to be. There are lots of gaps and there are lots of misunderstandings where you're looking at somebody else so that you get these blanket statements about how the Parthians fight, but actually they seem to be doing other things on other, <laughs> other occasions. So, you know, they can storm cities, they can besiege cities, which the Romans say they can't do, but hey, they do it. Um, and they wouldn't control their empire if they they weren't able to do this. So it's a different system. Probably there are fewer soldiers within the Parthian and the Sasanian military, but they are more expensive in a sense in that they, they're or the ones that really count are nearly all mounted and they have to be extremely good horsemen to do this, which requires a lot of practice. Mm -hmm. So you have you have royal troops, but you also have the the sort of semi-professional, the permanent retainers of um, the lesser kings, the nobles, and this sort of thing. But again, it's it's a different type of, of army to but it, it's one where that creates all sorts of logistical problems in that if you're going to feed lots of horses and keep them healthy, you've got to be either very organized or you've got to keep moving. Mm. Um, but you have it's it's rather like, I mean, we know more about the Mongols and how they organize, but when you look at medieval accounts of them, they get they, they don't miss because this is just somebody who frightens them and who just seems to turn up and then fights better. And once you get the, but the striking thing is when the Romans and Parthians first meet each other, both sides are really used to winning. Mm. And they both think that, well, we're the best warriors around, which is why we've conquered this great empire. Mm -hmm. And they expect this new foreigner they've met to be just as easy to defeat as everybody else they've come across. Because again, why wouldn't you? Mm. And there is that clash where the first few encounters tend to have rather more dramatic results before they start to learn that actually you have to be a bit careful when you go at either of these. And then the warfare becomes much more cautious on both sides. And the whole, one of the, the threads all the way through the book is how each side learns from the other and they adapt. And you might gain, gain an advantage for a short time, but it doesn't really last. They'll, they'll quickly, nearly always, one side you know, can work out, well, this is a way, if we can fight in these circumstances, we'll do better than if we let them make us fight in another way. So it, it's a story, again, where they come across very much as similar in the way they think and the way they react, even though they start with different styles of fighting, by the end, by the time you've got to the seventh century, their armies look incredibly similar. The Romans are now predominantly cavalry as well as the um, the Persians, but the Persians are fighting much more head to head and toe to toe, and they're not retreating as is the perception of the Parthians and the horse archers and the steppe nomads. You know, the, the classic Parthian horse archer isn't it really there as a major feature of the armies by that period. It's more this heavily armored guy who's Good to still using a bow, but he's shooting at you from close range and he's not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. And then he'll charge in with his sword or his mace uh, and finish off. So it's it's a very decisive, it's it's a way that the Romans have been fighting all the way along. But in a funny sort of way, the Roman armies have got more flexible and more willing to retreat and surprise and do that. So it's um it is this sort of constant back and forth and cat and mouse game as each each side seeks an advantage and then learns from what's happened and tries to do something better. Mm. It's, it's, it's very interesting. It sounds like there's this big amount of respect that they have for each other, but also a kind of, uh, you know, gamesmanship as well. It's, it's very interesting. I want to <clears throat> ask about um, uh, Crassius and is it uh, Oridus II? Um, mm. And introduce Armenia here because I found this very interesting. So talk about this conflict, but really what I'm asking is how does Armenia become a kind of ground in the middle 
And as we'll see, I think in the fourth and fifth century, it just continues for, for many, many centuries. Why? What is it about this? What makes this complicated? Why is there just, there's just kind of a geographical stuck in the middle of these things? Or is there something more? It kind of talk to us about, about this bit. It's, um, it's a mixture of all things. I mean, again, you come back to the, the Parthian king being king of kings. He's king of lots of other kingdoms. To some extent, that's also true of the Romans in the Republic and then the Empire. The Romans are very reluctant to shoulder the responsibility of running the empire they conquer. And they fight these wars and they win these victories. But for a long time, they really don't. I mean, the Roman Republic has almost no civil service at all and no bureaucrats. Mm. And when a governor goes out, he's got a staff of a few dozen people, half of whom are just basically sort of doormen and people like that. And then it's his family and people he can persuade to come with him. And you rely on the cities governing themselves and then you sort of regulate problems between them. But you also rely very much on allied kings and dynasts and queens and um, other groups that can do things for you and control an area. And the first meeting between Romans and Parthians back in the days of, of Sulla in the early first century BC mm -hmm. is when the Romans have intervened in Cappadocia and a Parthian envoy comes to them because they've got a bit closer to the Parthian empire. So that all of, of Western and Central Asia in particular is this patchwork of kingdoms now, some of them have fairly deep roots and sense of identity based around language and religion and a sort of sense of kinship, like Armenia to a fair extent. Others are pretty fluid, sort of Cappadocia, Bithynia, places like this, Pontus. They, they have a sort of a, a nucleus that, that considers itself that, but then it depends on the strength of individual rulers that expand. Hmm. Armenia is one of those areas in the... Um, sort of second quarter of the first century BC, the Armenians become the dominant power. And for a while, they have started to expand and take territory from the Parthians under a very successful king who had been a Parthian hostage when he was younger, but who just has this talent for warfare and politics and diplomacy and is exploiting the fact that everything is rather fluid. I mean, one thing Alexander had done was destabilize things. And then because none of his successes ever really give up on the idea of trying to reconquer all of Alexander's empire. They've spent a lot of time fighting each other, which means these regions change hands or are able to break away from the, the central big empires. Mm -hmm. And this is always the, the weakness in this system that you're, you know, if, if the, the king of kings isn't particularly strong, isn't particularly efficient, or is simply young and has a guardian of the, the nobility is battling over him or ups, you know, alienates people, is not good at dealing with all these these paying sufficient respect to the different communities and kings within the empire, you can start to have fragmentation. So Armenia has more of a basis as a, as a kingdom, but it's it's extremely rugged country. It's land where there's a lot of mountains, there's a lot of high valleys. There aren't that many routes that take you through the, the country, and they force you to go in particular directions. There are certain, if you look at a, a, these campaigns, century after century, armies go the same way and meet each other because that's really the only way they can go. And throughout this, it's, it seems to be quite a struggle for any king of Armenia, even the most successful, to control his own nobility because they've got their walled strongholds, their high positions, they're in the high valleys, they're in areas where it's difficult to reach. It's a bit like, if you look at a medieval kingdom, you can tell if the, the central king is powerful by how many castles there are. Because if there's lots of them out there, it means the locals, nobility, are able to build this, which makes them more of a problem if they do argue with the king. Um, whereas if the king's strong enough, he can stop people from building these places that are too difficult for him to take. Armenia is, is always a struggle, and it's always divided amongst itself, and there are repeated power struggles within the royal family. But it, it ends up being, it's a major player in the first century BC. And for a while, the Romans perceive it as at least as strong as Parthia, because Parthia is that much further away as well. But Armenia and Pontus have been the big enemies of the Romans um, in that, that time for a, about a generation. The Romans then defeat Armenia. and But again, it's they don't want to turn it into a province. They don't want to have to send out a governor. They don't want to have to send out a garrison. And particularly somewhere like Armenia, 
it's hard to control because, again, you've got the nature of the terrain, the nature of the society, and the sort of the independent spirit within the culture. So people don't necessarily follow central authority. They go and do their own thing. Um, that's going to require a lot of troops. So you really – you want somebody, you want a king to rule who's a friend of yours. And most of the time, I mean, people talk about these people as client kings, and there is a, there is a dreadful tendency – to look at all the, the smaller kingdoms and the main empires and sort of see them as pro-Roman or anti-Roman, pro-Parthian, anti-Parthian. They're not. They're, they are independent people with agendas of their own, out for their own advantage, just like the Romans and the, the Parthians are. They don't have the same resources, but on the spot, neither Rome nor Parthia can very often bring a really huge army and concentrate all its resources on, say, trying to control Armenia or trying to move into... Medea or Osirene or any of these other kingdoms that are there in the border areas. Now, Armenia, it's, it's partly the, the, the coincidence of the Romans coming from the West and the Parthians coming from the East. And as you say, Armenia is there in between. And it's, it gives the Armenians an opportunity because if you look through Roman history, whenever the Romans arrive and end up conquering an area, they are never um they never meet resistance of everybody there are always local leaders local communities who decide actually the romans might be useful the people we really hate aren't the romans but are our neighbors who live over there and have been raiding our farms and our cattle for so many generations that those are the people we hate maybe if i ally with the romans then i can get someone big and strong to help me fight the enemy i really dislike who's much more local and it's exactly the same with the Parthians when they appear. They're, they're big, strong figures. Now, Armenia is in a perfect position to play off the two empires against each other. And even if one king decides that actually it's in my best interest to be chummier with the Romans and stick with them or the, the king of kings in, in uh, and the Parthians, the, the nature of Armenian dynastic politics is that there'll be somebody in your family who's actually thinking, well, I could then go to the other empire and, you know, Basically, you make a, them bid for my loyalty. If they give me backing, then I can go on. So you get lots of troops being committed, but relatively small armies to aid what's, what's going on. And this is probably the context of Crassus. Crassus is he's famous. You know, he crops up in the old movie Spartacus, the man who defeated the slave rebellion. He's been successful in the Roman civil war. He's defeated the slaves afterwards. He's the great financier. He's one of the wealthiest men in Rome, very skillful politician. He becomes the ally of Pompey and Julius Caesar in this informal alliance. But even though he's quite old by Roman standards for active service, decides he wants glory and gets a command of Syria and clearly plans to go and intervene in Parthia. But the Parthian king of kings has only just won a civil war, having Combined, um, joined with his brother to overthrow their father. He's then fought with his brother and has finally defeated him. There's a pretty good chance that Crassus are originally thinking, I can intervene in a civil war and back one side, and that therefore that will give me money, glory, they will pay me, I'll get the prestige. Yeah, maybe I'll take a bit of territory, but you're not really... It's gone down. The problem is, because of Alexander the Great, when any Roman marches anywhere towards the Euphrates and beyond, Immediately, people start saying it's the new Alexander, or if they don't like the man, he's you know he's this fool who dreams he could be the new Alexander. Mm. And because Crassus gets killed, everybody um, trashes his reputation because there's there's no one has any interest in sort of saying well this is what he was really doing and whether it was sensible or not. He's a failure. The Romans don't like military failure. So Crassus probably tries to intervene in a Parthian civil war, which is decided before he gets there, but then probably thinks in a very Roman way, well, if I push in with an army, I can either force the man who's won to make concessions to me. And you don't have to conquer to get glory by, uh, for, in, in Roman society. If a people just submit to you, if they say that you as the representative of the Roman Republic are far more powerful than us, and then they they offer some, you know, token gifts or even substantial gifts, but you're not, you're not physically occupying them, you're not turning them into province, but they're just showing that they admit we're not as good as the Romans, we're not as powerful as the Romans. Mm. 
then that to do that to a people for the first time is immensely prestigious and something you can boast about, which is, is what Roman politicians want when they go out to command armies. But Crassus ends up intervening. He allies with the king of Armenia, but then, according to the sources, doesn't listen to advice of the king of Armenia. And the Parthians decide to form two armies. The king of kings goes off and threatens Armenia, thinking, well, actually, we know them. We understand how they fight. And probably we perceive them as a more serious threat than these Romans we don't really know anything about. And, you know, who've they've been around in the area, but they've never really come at us. They don't, you know, we don't. The problem is we know that the Romans are this big empire that's going to last for a long time, but people at the time didn't when you hadn't contacted them before. It's, mm -hmm. it's the same as communities in northern India try to withstand Alexander the Great's army because they don't know that he's conquered Persia and that it's probably a really bad idea to try and face these people who are not very nice and pretty brutal in the way they do things and very good at killing mm -hmm. by this time. Uh, but it's it's the same sort of thing. You know, Neither side knows enough, really. Um, Though there are similarities to what Caesar's doing in Gaul, and you know there are some contact, they may also think, well, Crassus maybe doesn't have the support as well as the skill to to defeat us. So you end up with the king of kings goes to Armenia, threatens Armenia strongly enough that the king decides there, okay, I'll do a deal, and there he marries. Uh, you know, they make a marriage alliance and they all settle down. So while the Romans are fighting elsewhere, Armenia that they thought was this, was their main ally have decided to do their own deal with the Parthians quite reasonably enough because it's in their interest and it's in the, the rulers there. Crassus fights this famous battle of Carhai, which is really the only battle between the Romans and Parthians that's described in any length, in any detail at all. Mm. And the next time we get that sort of account of a pitch battle isn't until, the, isn't until the 6th century AD with Procopius and very different Roman armies facing a very different Persian army. So that's a reminder of how problematic it is understanding a lot of the campaigns because Kahe has been used to be the typical battle when it probably isn't and it's a lot less simple than people make out but the Romans they suffer a, a check in the battle but their army is destroyed in the retreat because one thing it's never wise to do against a very mobile enemy like the Parthians with all their cavalry is run away in front of them because that's you know this is this is war as they understand it and they will hunt you down as they did and Crassus dies negotiating with them, and um, you know it, it disrupts Roman politics because the balancing factor between Caesar and Pompey has gone. Then there are three; no one individual is going to turn on the other two because that's that's too risky. But once there's only two, they become rivals. Within four years, the Romans have a, a major civil war when Caesar crosses the Rubicon to fight Pompey and his supporters. So mm. it has a major impact, but more on Roman politics and Roman reputation than actually on um, events in the wider world and the relations with Parthia. You know, the Parthians are mentioned, but and it becomes a, a convenient thing to say, well, we've got to get vengeance for the defeat of, of Crassus and the get back the prisoners that the Parthians have taken and all this sort of thing. But that develops as a politically convenient thing for Mark Antony and then for the Emperor Augustus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's interesting. Armenia seems independent thinking but also kind of a circumstance of kind of their geographical positioning in terms of literally their terrain i mean if you have locals that know how to occupy the terrain and other folks you know it's much more difficult well you can use that for your your advantage <clears throat> which is which is really really fascinating how that carries through so yeah so augustus that, that was my my next uh place here obviously much to say about him um, if I got this right, he kind of takes Rome from the Roman uh, Republic into the Roman Empire. And so he gives a lot of stability, peace, you know, success abroad. Um, you know, what, what was it that there was his how instrumental was he for this kind of peace between the Romans and the Parthians? And, you know, I mean, he's, he's well revered within the history. And when historians look on him, like, you know, he's, he's, he's a big accomplishments. But yeah, how did he negotiate that kind of peace between the, the Romans and Parthians? It, it's interesting because he, he does, he brings Rome's civil wars to an end, at least for a substantial period. Yeah. And 
you know, this is 20 years of extremely violent conflict within the Romans that follows on from earlier outbreaks of attempted coups and earlier civil wars. And um, and there is a sense you can you can see it reflected in the poetry of the period, you know, people like Horace and Virgil and uh, Propertius and others. People are just desperate for to wake up in the morning and not have somebody coming and confiscating your land or conscripting your son to go and fight in the army and just stability, peace. Not Because if you go to Rome now, you can see the Ara Parcus Augusti, the altar of Augustan peace, um, with this monument showing, you know, release of all the senators pr- processing off to her uh, and Augustus and his family. Um, but it's peace from internal struggle. There are only a couple of times during the reign of Augustus when Rome is not fighting a war somewhere. And he expands the empire in Europe to a great degree and to some extent in parts of North Africa as well. But he doesn't fight a major war against the Parthians. He he sends major forces of troops out there, um, family members as leaders, but it's diplomacy with a sort of, you know, a threat of force. But it doesn't ever turn into a war. And it's uh, the probability is it suits the Parthians as well, because they've had their own civil wars around about the same time as the Romans, which means that if you're king of kings, the last thing you want is this to fight a big conflict. And they've had the first encounter with Crassus, his great Parthian victory. But then later on, a decade or so later, when they go and they briefly overrun Syria, Judea, um, all this area. They then suffer serious defeats and the favoured son of the King of Kings is killed in battle fighting the Romans. And even if they blunt Mark Antony's offensive, it still doesn't gain them that much. So by this time, this I think is this generation where they're starting to realise that the Romans are understanding the Parthians are dangerous and the Parthians understand the Romans are dangerous. And Augustus fights lots of aggressive wars, but he very consciously chooses not to do that against the Parthians, in spite of poets saying, again, that he's going to be the new Alexander or his grandson is going to be the new Alexander or whoever it might be, whoever gets sent out in that area. And instead, they negotiate a peace that probably each side for its home market can present as this show, this is a great success, this is a victory. The Parthians can say to their subjects that the Romans have admitted that we're strong and that they need to treat us with respect. And Augustus is presenting the Parthians as you know, basing themselves, subjecting themselves to Roman rule so that that's, that's right and proper. Um, if you think of the, there's a line in Virgil's Aeneid, this, this great epic poem from Augustus' reign that where you know, Rome's destiny is proclaimed to parcere subjecti et debolare superbus, to spare the conquered and overcome the proud in war. And you have this Roman ideology, we divide everybody else in the world to either people you've already submitted to you or you've conquered. So then you're nice to them. Or the people who are so proud that they don't realize that Rome's great and therefore you need to go and frighten them or beat them up (laughs) until they do accept that you're better than they are and more powerful than they are and then show proper humility and respect and that's fine. But you don't actually need to to physically occupy their lands or conquer them. So it's that Augustus can present this. He'll build a Parthian arch in the center of Rome. Lots of months with great fanfare. He has built a temple, a new forum complex which you can see much of it today, in the temple of Mars Ultor, the war god Mars as the Avenger. And you bring back the standards, the eagles lost by Crassus, by Mark Antony, by others. And these are, once the temple is, is formally dedicated, these are installed there. And in the, the courtyard outside, there's a long series. There are rows and rows of statues of all the Romans who've won triumphs, going back to the mythical past, culminating in a August, statue of Augustus and a chariot. And this is the victory. So again, it's Peace for the Romans is peace through strength and victory, Mm. through everybody acknowledging that you are mightier and therefore being sensible enough not to fight you. It's it's not, they don't have, I mean, you could say this about most peoples in the ancient world, they don't have a concept of sort of peaceful coexistence between equals. So the peace has to be based around at least superficially you being able to say, well, the Parthians have admitted they're weaker than us. And but now that's of, fine. Some kind of element of submission, almost. Whether yeah, it's, exactly, it's, it's, it's an honest submission, or uh, okay, we'll tell you that. But you know, yeah. but it seems well, like it, that's their way of being having peace. But there's also the king of kings can go back and tell most of his noblemen that the Romans have behaved in just the same way to them. You know, it, it's <laughs> and that's how there is always, and it develops and it gets stronger. The sense that whichever empire it is thinks of itself as the center of the world. And this is particularly pronounced in the, for the Sasanian Persians in their form of Zoroastrianism, but it's 
you're the you're the right society. Your laws are the best. Your kings are the best. Your religion is the best. You're more civilized than everyone else. But the Romans or the Persians, whoever is looking at it, the other empire is almost as good. You know, it's quite good. It's better than all the other sort of barbarians out there, whoever they are. So you can treat it with respect as long as it knows its place. So it's not an equal, but it's sort of it's it's more equal. It's closer to you than everybody else. It sounds again. That's where you can kind of see empire in any place in history kind of always thinks that are best i mean if you look at even the modern world today you know the united states loves to say how they're the best country in the world they're the richest country they're the most you know you know whatever and most powerful biggest military and you know i mean i guess that's debatable you know the british empire did that for a little bit obviously the french did that the dutch you know the mm-hmm. portuguese you know etc you know the spanish mm-hmm. it's it's very interesting how that's always this kind of vibrato that that empires have and and the other ones are yeah they're okay but they're not quite as good as us they're kind of a little bit especially see this in 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 as we get to kind of modernity mm. um you know where where you, where you have this kind of space between what is it the dutch portuguese and i guess the british they were all kind of just you know going out into the mm. out east trying to see like you know who, who leaves their stamp and who's better and yeah you know whatever this the dutch are doing this but we do this better you know th- this kind mm. of thing it doesn't sound too dissimilar i mean obviously there's differences but you know in terms of the kind of uh mindset or the approach that's being had of of empire of how that well, is well you need to have that confidence to go and do these things because yeah. they do yeah. they do take chances and all of them yes they've got considerable military might and power but it is often staggering how small numbers of of people will go out and dominate a new area and they'll get away with things they'll take great risks and mostly it comes off every now and again they get the disaster like crassus and it all goes horribly wrong but um and that's the big thing whereas you know if you look at history of the british empire it's always got a competitor or several competitors Mm -hmm. wherever it is Mm -hmm. the romans don't really apart from the parthians and the sasanians in the east you know, there's no equivalent to that on the European frontiers, nothing like it at all. North African frontiers, again, nothing like it at all. Once Carthage has gone much earlier on, you're not. Um, so there's a slight, the, the Romans can have, a, it could reinforce the sense that, well, yes, we are best. We are the only civilized place in the world because the contrast is so marked mm-hmm. between the sheer scale of the empire and its resources compared to anything else. And in part, even though they know from the stories of Alexander the Great just how big the Parthian and Persian Empire is, a lot of it is so far away. You know, no Roman army ever gets to modern-day Iran. Yeah. That area. It just doesn't go that far. In the same way, there's never the slightest chance of a Parthian or a Persian army turning up on the River Tiber in Rome. It, it's so, <laughs> so it sort of makes it a bit easier to yeah. see yeah. yourself as that much better. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, the... the Parthians and the Sasanians have a little bit of diplomatic contact with China, but again, most of the time it is too far away to be a, a meaningful rival yeah. um, or competitor. And so the closest they get is with each other. Mm. And that's what makes this relationship interesting because it's been rare in other periods of history where there's only been two empires. Mm. Mm. There's yeah. usually been a, a bit more. Um, yeah, yeah. That, that, that is interesting how that, how that works, and I wonder. It's it's also interesting how you know times evolve with technology. There's 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 a there's a, a probably a big aspect of that as well. So I, I want to jump ahead to some of the more uh, you know, move forward in time a little bit. But before we come out of the first century, maybe just real quick, uh, two kind of uh, uh, footnotes here. You mentioned that there's not a lot of detailed narrative history of the golden age of the Roman Empire um of in first and second centuries you know why do you think that is and uh, a separate question but also in the first century is uh the importance of the silk roads and then how that was instrumental for the economies of both the roman roman excuse me and uh parthian uh, empires the biggest problem you face when you look at the ancient world is that there were histories written about all of these things it's just that we have the tiniest tiniest fraction of of what once existed you know, most books from the ancient world haven't survived the fall of the Roman Empire. And then th- we only have them if the manuscript was copied again and again and preserved usually in a monastic library. 
So otherwise things perish, they were destroyed. So even things that went in a fire in, in a monastery in you know 12th century or something, that means it's gone. Mm. Archaeologically, you find papyri, which tend to give you day-to-day -day records and letters and private things or business accounts. Mm. Very, very rarely do you get a trace of any historian. There have been a few, the Oxyrhynchus mm. historian, that's something. But mostly we've pretty much got the only, the only ancient literature that survives is stuff that's been known about for 500 years or more, sometimes even longer. Yeah. Um, and it's not likely to to be to increase um, yeah. anytime soon. So um, it's it's a problem. I mean, we tend to have some of the what was considered to be the greatest literature of the ancient world. There's more chance of that surviving because, again, more people copied it. Yeah. And even if it was just within the Catholic Church because you wanted to preserve good Latin. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, for instance, there's uh, when you look at the campaigns in the middle of the second century AD with the Emperor Lucius Verus, the um, adopted brother of Marcus Aurelius, goes out, leads an expedition that goes down, burns the Parthian capital, this sort of thing. Um, we have a satire written by Lucian about how bad histories of this campaign were, how sycophantic they were, how ignorant they were. But it's you know, it's like a comedian trying to make lots of jokes. So he says, well, you know, this, this, this fellow who was a doctor who claims he knows everything and all this sort of thing about military tactics. And the, But the, the frightening thing is, is because none of these have survived, let alone any of the good sources that may have been written at the time, good accounts of this, scholars have to make use of little fragments they get from basically a sort of stand-up comedian's routine um, about this, just trying to glean little bits of information we could pin down. So major events happen and we know next to nothing about them. And you you see it, um, you know, it's not a war against the Parthians, although he did fight one, but um, you go to Rome today, you can see Trajan's column and it's this spiral, great column with all along the side, there's reliefs carved of Roman soldiers marching, building camps, fighting against the Dacians, Campaigns in modern-day Romania. And it's clearly a story, but we have no narrative to go with it. So trying to make sense of those pictures, it's like having the Bayer Tapestry, but without the captions, without any knowledge of what's going on in England and Normandy at the, in the 11th century. So we have this problem again and again, and it, it's uh, there's so much we don't know about the Roman side. There's, there's even more we don't know about the, the Parthian Persian perspective. So it's, it's, it's simply a problem, and... It's unlikely that we'll ever discover. I mean, I'd love to think that good accounts of Trajan's campaigns or all these other things would turn up and histories we know existed, but it, it's you know it's it's not likely to happen. Mm. And, the, and the and the Silk Roads, yeah. Sorry, trade is interesting as well because obviously we think of the the Silk Roads and there's you know this the, there's this very romantic image of trains of camels you know coming under the moonlight across the desert sands, which happened. There are people moving goods throughout um, the period, but particularly during the, the height of the Pax Romana, the height of prosperity. And you even get Roman sources complaining about the amount of gold that's going east to India and beyond. Now, we know of trade by land. We know of a lot of trade by sea. The um, Cleopatra's family had developed ports along the Red Sea that the Romans then promote as well and guard that would use the monsoon winds to get to Sri Lanka, to India. And then from there, people go further or goods come through. So it's something that, I mean, it's quite interesting when um, there are these Chinese sources about embassies and expeditions going and reaching eventually Parthia. And they talk a lot about trade and produce. And uh, it's, it's basically trying to think of, okay, how do we do this? How would we actually, what's, what's to our advantage? What's worth getting here? What are these people like? How can we rely on it? Things pass from the Roman Empire into the Parthian and later the Persian Empire. They're taxed at every stage. And, you know, it's generally good for whether it's they come by sea, whether they go by land. But you have obviously things like silk coming from, from China that is highly prized within the Roman Empire. And what in the late Republic is really expensive and only the super rich can afford becomes more and more common. You know, the quantities involved, it's like pearls, it's like pepper, it's spices. Um, think of the Christmas story, you know, frankincense, myrrh, things coming from um, Southern Arabia, this sort of thing. It's a huge appetite for this. And because of the prosperity of the Roman empire, there's lots of money there. People are willing to, you know, it's a good market to exploit. Um, 
But you also have things like amber coming from the Baltic through the Roman Empire and being high, highly valued at the Chinese court mm. and talk of Roman trained slaves and jugglers and performers and things. Like that. So you even have people who do go all the way from one empire to the other or the extraordinary um, development where mostly in Syria, but within the Roman Empire, various workshops find out that they can take Chinese silk and reweave it to make it finer mm. and make a different, more shimmery, almost sort of semi-transparent fabric. They then sell that back to the Chinese. And the Chinese think that the Europeans have a different type of silkworm. It takes a long time to twig in the same way that Obviously, the secret of the silkworm is, is preserved. So they, that's not discovered until very late in our period where some monks smuggle um, eggs out and silkworms out in the venture. But it takes a while before there's a European silk industry. But they've, they've sort of created one where they, they reweave and they dye it in ways that are different in the same way that things are coming from China that people in the West just don't know how to produce. Roman glass is highly valued, even though it's, it's you know, if you look at it, it's, it's very, it's this sort of slightly greenish, greeny, bluish sheen on it, but it's very fine, very delicate, which to transport is, is a, a challenge, but people do it because, again, it's prized as being exotic, as being valuable. As, you know, the, in many, There are certain aspects where the Chinese are far more advanced than anything that's happened in the Greco-Roman world than others, mm. and there are a few where the opposite is true. Mm. And each side, you know, these mean that there, there is produce that then people want. Um, so, you know, Chinese... Uh, can more reliably produce steel than the Ro Romans and Greeks can do it, but they, it's it's a bit more chancy. They they can't mass produce or at least consistently produce it to the same level and the same quality every time they do it. Mm. But again, steel is something that comes in small quantities because it's so heavy to transport. But uh, Parthian and Persian aristocrats in particular will value weapons made from Chinese steel. And some of it will eventually get to the Roman Empire, but, but smaller and smaller. So it, it's something that seems to be mutually beneficial to, to mm -hmm. both empires because it, it gives you access to luxury goods. It also gives you revenue because at every stage, you know, the, there is a great emphasis on how much more something costs that's come all this distance, how much more it costs within the empire. But there's lots of people along the supply chain that have taken their cut on that. So it isn't just... Uh, uh, and of course, the emperor and the, the state is getting money as well because you're taxing everything that comes in and the, the levies are substantial. So it, it is mutually beneficial that neither side ever wants to stop it. They do make efforts at various times, there's competition over markets, whether it's along the East African coast, whether it's in Sri Lanka with Persian or Parthian merchants trying to exclude Roman merchants from... Uh, the sort of competition you'd expect in any period, you know, people would prefer if they could be the ones who get the main profits. So, um, so there's rivalry in that sense over this. So it, it's um, again, it's 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 merely proof of just how beneficial this is to everybody. This is so interesting how something like that. I mean, I, I, folks may have have uh, I had a chat with Peter Frankelman who who's obviously wrote about the Silk Road, so people can check that out. But mm. it's interesting how something like that was able to there's something interesting about material goods mm. having this applicable use for all different people groups even across mm. thousands of miles at a different time and how people will place mm. uh, emphasis on certain things and it's it's very it's very fascinating i want to jump to constantine cuz mm. i mean he's i mean <laughs> he's he's tremendous for world history of course mm. um uh, I had a conversation with Peter Heather. He wrote a book oh, yeah. uh, on, on uh, what's the book? Uh, Christendom is, I think, the mm. name of the book. And um, so we talked about Constantine a lot. Mm. Obviously, huge for expansion of Christianity in the Roman Empire. He, he has this this interesting. Um, I don't know if it's his theory, but he talks about it in the book. Uh, so I don't know if it's like just a, one of these kind of camps that hold this. But his belief about Constantine with Christianity is interesting. Mm. He thinks he was always a Christian. Um, and before he publicly stated so, and that he saw his like, um, uh, proclamation of his Christianity and for the empire in like four stages. It was very interesting how, how his, mm. his view was, uh, I think he says in the book that it was you know, many people didn't see it that way or they see it a different way. But so obviously Constantine is, 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 is huge for, for, for Christianity. And, um, it, there's a, 
alternative history there with like, you know, if he probably wasn't there or someone like him, Christianity might have died off and it would not have been, you know, there's some people that will make those claims yeah. that his, that's how important he was, mm-hmm. that he was so like for pushing yeah. it. But, you know, maybe some people make that too far. All that said, how do you see, so we know a lot of that story, but what was his interactions with this, this, this rivalry with the Parthians uh, still at this point, I believe. And how was he interacting with them with, you know, obviously he was, you know, very strong on spreading Christianity and how he ruled. Um, but what was his kind of space in this kind of rivalry between the, the Parthians? Uh, well, by this time, you've got from the sort of second quarter of the um, third century, the Sassanian dynasty has taken ah, yes, over sorry. Yes, the sorry. empire. But, but essentially, as I say, it's the same empire. It's just a different ruling house. Uh-huh. That manages just as the Parthian, the Arsacid family had said, well, nobody who isn't of royal blood from our family can ever be king of kings. The Sasanians managed to change it. Well, now nobody who's not a Sasanian <laughs> can be king of kings. But you're, right. you're ruling the same empire. The thing to remember about Constantine is he is one of the strong men of the Roman Empire. And he reunites the Roman Empire. They've been divided into East and West and under different emperors. But most of his campaigns are actually spent fighting other Romans. And most of his great victories... And that's how he brings the empire back together. Um, so, so, so less of his uh, impact of with the Persians at this point in the uh, third century, yeah, third fourth, century, fourth. third fourth, fourth century, yeah, uh, fourth century. More so, kind of internal. Yeah, I mean, he is he wants stability as far as possible with the part with the Persians. There's been a major war again. Um, just before his reign. And uh, his father was one of the Tetrarchs, one of this group of four emperors under Diocletian that sort of um, share power so that they can, they've got basically four people to send to crisis points. Right. Um, there's struggle there that the Romans do badly at first, but then they do very well fighting the Persians in Armenia and um, recover. So there's, there's an element where the advantage has swayed a bit the Roman way and the Persians are having problems with internal difficulties of their own. Um, but Constantine, as I say, he has to fight a lot, but many of his victories are the big wars are against other Romans. Mm -hmm. The change, one thing, and this is, I understand from the point of view of faith, but as if you simply look at it as a historian, you have to be very careful when you define, you look at the number of Christians around with Constantine, you define it on a theological basis Mm -hmm. as we would understand what a true Christian is. Mm. Clearly, it makes political sense for him to do this. Lots of people support it, which probably means there are more people who consider themselves at least a bit Christian. Mm. Because bear in mind, you've come from a polytheistic tradition. Mm. And we have a story, for instance, in the late source about the Emperor Severus Alexander, who has these little statuettes of gods, people he reveres, one of whom is Jesus. Mm. And if you come from that idea, I, I remember talking to a chap who'd been a missionary in Christian missionary in India, saying, well, people will often say from a Hindu perspective, yes, fine, I can revere this man, but I'm yeah. just adding him yeah, yeah, to yeah, the pantheon yeah. that's already there. And mm-hmm. we can think, you know, we know very clearly what Christianity means and is, mm-hmm. and you are or you aren't today. Whereas there are probably a lot of people in the ancient world who can say, well, actually, some of what's been, you know, they're, they're saying, I quite like this. This sounds reasonable. But I don't need to stop leaving an offering to Venus or Mars or you know Demeter, whoever it happens to be, or um, you know some Iron Age Celtic deity, as well. These can coexist, and obviously some of that will expand into as the development of saints and their you know the, um, the reverence offered to them. You're sort of filling the place of someone. Who do you go to for a particular problem yeah. rather than a sort of global thing, or for help with some need? The big change that will happen with Constantine is there are already Christians in the. Parthian and Persian empires. Mm. You know, the, the, um, and there's a tradition that this is the um, faith has been spread much earlier. And you've had, in the same way that you've had before this, you've had substantial Jewish communities in Babylonia mm. and Seleucia on the Tigris, and this sort of thing. Very large that, for instance, in the first century AD were annually sending delegations with offerings to the temple in Jerusalem, crossing from one empire to the other. Um, in armed caravans, and nobody's bothered by this at all. It's just seen as perfectly normal. So there have been an element, though there is a possibility that when you have rebellions against Trajan's occupation of parts of the Parthian Empire, and at the same time a rebellion of the Jewish population in Egypt and Cyrenaica, is there some coordination, or is it simply a thought of, well, it's a good opportunity, or you know, purely be a chance? Um, but it does mean that as Rome becomes more and more associated with Christianity 
And depending on the enthusiasm of the King of Kings, a particular form of Zoroastrianism that is more centralized than the one that has been most common under the Parthians is being promoted by the, the King of Kings of, of Sasanian Persia, that you start to see a conflict and the emperor starts to, Constantine begins to do this, speak up on behalf of Christian communities within the Persian Empire. Now, whether this is sincere, whether he thinks these are people of my own faith that I need to support, or whether it's a good excuse diplomatically, or quite possibly both, because why should we expect people to be just simple and have only one reason for this? And this will be, it's really a direct source of conflict, but it does mean that at times Christians are treated with suspicion by mm. the Persians in a way they weren't before, because they're associated in the same way Zoroastrians, but also the followers of the prophet Mani and the Manichaeus can be seen as suspicious to both sides because the Romans see them as Easterners and more like the Persians and the Persians see them as not pure Zoroastrians and people we have to watch, particularly when they start to gain support or at court and this sort of thing. So they can be a faction. thing. So it, it adds an extra complication. In the longer run, the greater emphasis on a, an organized church within the Roman Empire and the sense of the emperor as God's representative on earth actually makes him closer to the king of kings self-perception. Mm. Um, that, but there's always been that sense that Rome rules because the gods are on their side and the gods, you know, favor um, Rome. That's and therefore the proof is the fact, well, we've got this big empire, so we must be doing something right. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's, it's there. Constantine is, has a relatively small part to pay, play personally in this struggle. He is supposed to be planning a Persian expedition just for his death, mm. but we don't know enough. Again, it's always difficult when somebody dies before they actually do something. Everybody's, you know, can easily distort what they were, what they planned, what they wanted to do. Mm. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. I like that. I like that perspective within the context of the story you're telling. Cause again, many people know about the certain facts about Constantine, but, but, you know, I think it's interesting context here. Just real quick, because I want to keep moving ahead uh, through through the couple of centuries here, but uh, I just want to flag again Armenia. So it comes up again in this part of the book of yeah. late 4th into the 5th century. Uh, you introduced the Goths and the Huns as important players in the 5th century. So again, we I remember I was reading the book and I was like, oh, here they are again. So mm. how does our Armenia continue? I mean, we're again, we're in the 5th century now. How do they continue to have this role between these two big empires and, and what was that like? Was it still this kind of independent minded kind of using their kind of geographical location or how did things evolve over, over the centuries? It's, it's essentially, you know, the dynastic politics within Armenia is very dangerous and very competitive, but there are plenty of people who always want to try to get to the top because you know that if you don't succeed, you'll still be viewed with suspicion by everybody else. So, mm. you know, you've got to keep winning every every day, every month, every year almost. <laughs> and it's still this factor. You've got the Persians on one side, the Romans on the other, mm. that you can use as supporters. Now, Christianity obviously plays a, a, a major role here when the, the king of Armenia converts and Armenia becomes Christian earlier, mm. more openly than the Romans. Uh, but the Romans follow within a generation or so, so they're, they're able to, that in one sense moves them closer to Rome, and that's clearly viewed with suspicion from a Persian perspective. So this does influence and shift the, the sort of military political balance. But there's still an element where, uh, from a Persian perspective, you don't want the, the Armenia to get so close to Rome that if they want to, the Romans can easily get their armies through Armenia to attack your territory, because mm. it means that the, the regional kings of those provinces that are often members of your family will feel unsupported. And if they do, then they're likely to rebel against you. So it, it's all part of the, it's it's a big piece of the sort of central locking piece in the jigsaw, really, that, that keeps the others in place. <laughs> and every time it comes slightly out of place, things wobble around and you have to, there are more direct, Persian attempts to control Armenia, and eventually they will succeed and they will occupy the bulk of Armenian territory. Uh, but they always have to keep fighting for it. There is rebellion after rebellion. It's the same of other kingdoms around the Black Sea in this area, mm. like Iberia and um, the others that where, again, leaders can start to see, well, the Persians are closer, they're pressing, but I might be able to get Roman support to drive them off, which will give me independence. And maybe the Romans will want less. 
So the more you try to control the area, the more incentive you give to local leaders to seek help from elsewhere, which is the other empire. Mm. So, and there are there are several attempts where Zoroastrian religion is is pushed very heavily. Fire temples are built, are strengthened. People are encouraged to develop them. And that provokes rebellion again and again. Mm. Um, so you know, there's provocation, but there's always an. But sometimes the reason for rebellion is misbehavior of the the governor, the army commander, the satrap you sent. Mm. Um, and that's true on on each side. You know, the the man on the spot can really mess things up if he annoys people, if he, you know, is, is brutal or, you know, in one case, there's a Persian who sleeps with lots of Armenian noblemen's wives, this sort of thing. So they clearly don't like that. And this is, um, you, and this is, this is again, something that runs through all imperial history is if the man on the spot is, is very bad at his job and very provocative, he can create problems out of all scale to the, the sort of the fairly mundane, the lower levels of corruption and, and, and insults people can deal with. But every now and again, you get someone who is spectacularly good or spectacularly bad who can just throw everything out of kilter. <laughs> oh, man. It's, it's, it's very interesting. Again, I, it just makes me you know interested more to hearing more about their, their history. Let me jump to uh, more in the... Um, in the next century, the sixth century, uh, Justinian, um, fascinating figure. Peter Saris uh, has a book coming out. I just finished it uh, on on Justinian, uh, fa- fabulous book. Hmm. And did um, I, I got the sense, and he was he was very interesting. Hmm. But the sense with him was that he was pretty zealous in how not just in how his 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 uh, Christian beliefs were, but like hmm. how much he. It, it, put that instantiate that into law at the time when he was was emperor and how much he wanted people and and consequences if you weren't kind of abiding by those kind of religious laws um so maybe just chat about about him and how he, kind of his reign you mentioned in the book during you know uh during the the empire this at this time and you know he has some a lot of achievements but again how is this you know a strong figure uh juxtaposed with you know the persians at the time as well on the other side of the world you know you have a strong figure on this other side of the empire it's like oh you know do we got to watch out for this how do we play nice do we you know how how was their kind of engagements in, at this time it's i mean it helps because we've got a good source again we've got procopius that gives us such detailed narrative and quite a lot of other sources as well that flesh this out in different notes so we can talk about the personalities of this period more than simply emperor so and so did this that and the other but we don't <laughs> really know why and of yeah. course the you know someone who's presiding over the collection and codification of latin law and roman law that survives and, and is the basis for so much medieval law as well um this is important, but this is someone who sends these expeditions that retakes most of the Western Mediterranean that goes to Italy. You know, mm. Rome becomes Roman again, which it hasn't been for a long time since the collapse in the end of the fifth century of the Western Roman Empire. Mm. So an awful lot happens under Justinian. And the relationship with the East is almost as if he'd prefer to have as little to do with it as possible. He'd really prefer the Persians to be not a problem uh, because he's got all these other things he's desperate to do. But the problem is you've had this context whereby earlier, before he's emperor, you've had outbreak of war in the early 6th century, where the Persians are starting to feel the pressure, as they always have at various times, but from nomadic groups that are attacking them to the north and to the northeast. And some of these, if they break through the passes between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, can then end up getting into Armenia and through Armenia into Roman territory. Mm. And at various times, there's been a claim, well, you know, can't we join together to, to fight these people or to, to block them off to defend these areas? The Persians have been using the pretext of we need money to, for our border defenses that benefit you as well as us. But there's, a, there's always an element that when the Roman emperor senses the Persians are weak or Persian king of kings senses the Romans are weak, it's good to fight a limited war to get money to get glory and prestige because you've got an opportunity. So there's, this happens more and more frequently, and this is part of, of Justin, his, his uncle, and then Justinian's reign, where there are several conflicts with fortunes going either way, and the Romans win some victories, they suffer defeats as well. What has happened in this time is both sides have developed a whole row of very highly fortified cities along the border, which means that invading and getting right through into settled territory is really hard. 
So the war is fought around these garrisons that, and it's, you know, the Romans provoke the Persians by building a new city that's closer to the, that's a bit closer and installing a general and a garrison there. That provokes um, a response saying, well, that's so it's a bit about, so it's sort of slightly, you know, showing off, jockeying position, trying to show, well, I am bigger and stronger than you and you've got to put up with this, which neither empire wants. And then particularly that resentment whenever there's, um, a sense of an opportunity where they see actually you're not as strong as you used to be or you're busy elsewhere. So the more Justinian concentrates on the West, the more the Persians think, well, actually, we've got an opportunity to just push back a bit and show that, no, really, you know, this is, we're strong, you need to show respect for us. Mm -hmm. So that's part of really the story then. And it it develops during the course of the 6th century, warfare becomes common in a way that it had not been in the, the 5th century. When on the whole, both empires have decided that really we don't want any trouble with them because we've got enough problems elsewhere mm. that um, if we can have a stable frontier with the Romans, which the advantage is if you've got an agreement with the head of the other empire, it's going to apply over a much wider area than an agreement with a particular warlord amongst the nomadic tribe or a, uh, you know, a less organized kingdom elsewhere. So the wars are bigger when you fight it each empire fights the other, but they're also, the peace is, is easier to organize and more likely to be maintained. Mm. But there is this breakdown during the course of the sixth century, you have this just greater frequency. And the problem is each time one side wins an advantage in the, the treaty that ends this by the Romans several times have to agree to pay money to the Persians, supposedly to, for this frontier defense system, but half the time it's just a, it's an admission that we're not quite as strong as you. Mm. at the time. And that's something that in the early empire, the Romans would never openly admit, even if it was in fact true. Yeah. By this time, they will, but they're still pretending. But it leaves this resentment that if the treaty wasn't in our favor last time, then as soon as you look at all vulnerable, we're going to fight you again to make sure we can change, a have a new treaty that is more in our favor again. Mm. And it, it develops this cycle so that the wars just become more frequent. Even if they're still basically fought in the borders and some of these frontier cities change hands, but on the whole, it's campaigns around them and raids and things like that. It's not not major invasions. Hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. You're, you're kind of answering there this uh, this kind of oscillation between you know peace in the fifth century, war in the sixth century, a little bit more balanced by the seventh. So one of the last questions I have for you, we can kind of last big thing, and then we can. Uh, I have one final question is obviously, like I mentioned in the beginning is, uh, Muslim Arabs, uh, and kind of in a way, I think you mentioned in the book, this sort of disillusion of this rivalry because they become a very big powerhouse and, and, and really it's a, it's a big shift in world, in world history and in, 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 uh, religious history. It's, it's tremendous. I mean, it's, it's one of the three you know major religions in the world still today, so just chat about that in the 7th century, mid-7th se mid century uh, onwards, uh, and kind of where you're in the book in the year 700-ish AD, uh, of how, just just how that happened and how consequential it was so rapidly. Most of the wars in the 6th century are still very limited in their objectives. You know, the Persians and the Romans want a treaty that favors them. They want some money, they want some glory, but then they don't push too far. That changes in the 7th, partly because the Romans have intervened in a Persian civil war and a king of kings has been, who's been forced to flee is reappointed by, with the backing of a Roman army and lots of the backing of lots of noblemen within the Persian Empire, but also the Romans are there. The Roman emperor who does this is then murdered and the Persian king of kings uses this as a pretext or genuinely wants revenge for the man he's called father and who has restored him to power, he wages war. But for a while, the Romans are so busy fighting their civil war that the Persians start to, by in sort of years of fairly grueling warfare, that's not well described, they start taking all these border fortresses. Hmm. And they end up breaking this hard crust around the Roman Empire, and there isn't much behind it. And then they win some victories, and the Roman armies that there are defeated they start to, the, the for once the King of Kings seems to look and think, actually, I could probably win this. I can probably either destroy the Roman Empire or cripple it to such a degree that it will never be a threat again. So instead of just thinking of the next treaty, he's, you start to think, actually, I can end this. 
and he stops negotiating. And all the wars up until now, they spend every few months, their ambassadors going back and forth. They're trying to, even though it takes often years for a peace treaty to come and the war to end, they're talking about it all the time. But while one side thinks it can get more of an advantage, they'll keep fighting. That changes. They stop talking. The Persians overrun Syria. They overrun Palestine. They overrun Egypt. They ally with the the Bulgars who are attacking. Sorry, the Avars who are attacking um, Constantinople itself. And there's a, a Persian army more than once is the other side of the Bosporus looking at Constantinople. It's got to that stage. The Romans somehow win this under the Emperor Heraclius, who campaigns, raids deep into Persian territory, and eventually the Persians have overstretched themselves. Nobles turn against the king of kings. Their own civil war happens. The war comes to an end rather abruptly, and it goes back to a situation where the Romans get back pretty much all the territory they've lost. But within less than a decade, the growth of the Muslim Arab um, groups and their armies just spill out. And from being perceived as a minor threat Mm -hmm. by both empires, the Persians have been far more active. They've tried to occupy a lot of the lands around the Arabian Gulf and dominate this. So in many respects, the the Islamic sources make it absolutely clear that the Persians are the, the most hated enemy. And also... The Romans may be Christians, which, but at least they're monotheists. You know, they're 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 misguided. Is the the Islamic perspective? You know, they haven't they haven't understood. They haven't heard the message. And there'll be a strange later tradition whereby emperors like Heraclius are presented as people who would have converted to Islam if only they'd been labelled to politically. You know, deep down they understood that this message was right. So you have these armies appearing, and they overrun territory very very quickly. There are a few big battles that the Persians and the Romans respectively lose. And you can look and you can say, well, the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire are both weak because they've ground each other into the dust fighting this this exhausting war. Mm -hmm. And the the Arab armies will overrun all the provinces of the Roman Empire that the Persians had overrun just a few years before, almost as quickly, if not sooner. And then the Arab armies also sweep through the Persian Empire and it collapses within just a few years and is taken over. And you can see it as weakness on the part of the two big empires, but you've also got to see it. These Arab armies are extremely well motivated. They are very good at fighting, and they are also pretty shrewd politically. And they are good at, you know, they treat people well when they conquer these areas. We tend to think of later periods where religious wars tend to be far more violent, and that will happen. But there isn't at this early stage an automatic hatred of Christians to Muslims and vice versa. And even with the Zoroastrians, to some extent, there's not... The Emperor Heraclius could assure his men when they were fighting the Persians, when Rome looked as if it was on the brink of destruction, that death in battle would guarantee your place in heaven. Mm. He doesn't do that, and nor do his successors when they're fighting the Arab armies. Mm. It's not that same appeal. It, It does look at first as if it's quite a while before the Romans or the Persians can take the Arab armies that seriously. Because the tradition has always been that people from that area, they come, they raid, they steal things, they go home. Mm -hmm. And these aren't doing this. And not only are they not doing this, but they're consolidating these areas quite quickly. But partly that's because if you're in Egypt or Syria, then you've already given in to the Persians once in living memory. And the Arabs come along and you think, well, the Roman, there isn't likely to be a Roman army along anytime soon. Let's just wait. We'll accept them because... They seem to be treating people quite well, and maybe the Romans will come back. Hopefully they will, but we we don't have the military might to oppose them. So why die for a cause, an empire that that may succeed or may not? So there's uh, there are two sides to it. One of the problems is that, again, the sources are so limited. But you can see stages whereby the Arab armies will push along the North African coast and again, it coincides with periods of Roman weakness. And there are brief resurgences when the Romans are organized. But the Romans, as they lose territory, they lose Egypt, and it's the breadbasket is gone, just as the Western Empire suffers very badly when it loses North Africa, which is, again, one of these very productive areas. Yeah. You lose revenue, you lose food supplies, you lose manpower. And you lose them permanently. Whereas the Persians occupy them for a few years, you get them back. But you're you're weaker and you're not able to take these places back. And you've still 
it's it's mostly gone by now, but you were still desperately trying to cling on to all the stuff that Justinian had taken in the West, mm. but you're also losing. So you both empires have probably overstretched themselves, but that shouldn't take anything away from the the skill, really, of the the the, the Arab Muslim armies seem to find a lot of very good commanders mm. and who know how to fight the different each empire in a different way and use their strengths against them. You know, in the um 536, the, the campaign there, the Romans are consistently outmaneuvered in the course of a couple of weeks fighting by Arab armies that may may not be any bigger, may even be smaller than the Roman armies they're fighting, but they're well led, they're well motivated, they're good, they're skillful. Yeah. That's 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 deeply fascinating. And I wonder if some of that internal stuff starts to kind of just like kind of sort of rot away in some ways because you would think that you know the the might of the the Roman Empire or even the Persian Empire would be able to just kind of like you know blow past you know people that have uh, not, not not as big of a, an empire or maybe not as much you know you know different types of training. But it's very interesting how those things aren't always particularly relevant, and I guess it really just depends on a lot of different factors. My my final question for you, uh, you've been very generous with your time, is you've, uh, <laughs> this is your 14th book, if I counted it right. I could be wrong on that. Uh, uh, yeah, 14th nonfiction. nonfiction. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, <laughs> you know, it's over 500 pages, and which actually seems short considering how much you covered. <laughs> you've covered 700 years. So it's, 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 a, it's really uh, pretty, pretty amazing. Um, this whole story that you've told, uh, what do we see if we do these kind of ripple effects of this seven year, seven hundred year conflict? Excuse me, between the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire, um, for maybe respective regions in our modern day, right? So obviously, a lot of time since um, you know seven hundred AD, but what do you what do you see in terms of um, you know I guess you know modern day. Uh, it, you know, Italy or maybe, you know, uh, Constantinople is Istanbul. So, you know, it's very close by there, you know, the Greek, Turkey, Italy, uh, these kind of very big, big nucleus of the Roman Empire. And then obviously you have Iran, um, uh, which is, you know, kind of a almost a direct kind of uh, descendant there. Of course, there was other regions to it as well. But how do we see the 700 year rivalry in the world today, if we do, and, and what that looks like? It's it's difficult because we don't have just the two big empires that are so much bigger than everything else. Mm -hmm. there are, there's more in between. And obviously, perceptions of international relations are very different um, today. But there's, there's an element whereby Europe will have the culture that is heavily influenced by the Greco-Roman tradition combined with Christianity. Um, but some of that has already happened before this rivalry is over. The, the, the Western Empire has gone, but the kingdoms set up by Germanic warlords have adopted Catholicism. They've adopted, you know, they've very quickly, they've tried to preserve aspects of this great empire, but they can't really because they don't have the infrastructure to back it up. Mm. You can't do that without the, the size, the organization, the wealth. Mm. Um, there's an element where some of these countries, I mean, again, their subsequent history is still influenced by the climate, by the geography that, yeah. that follows through. Um, you've obviously got the later changes where by, I mean, one of the problems is, and it, I've tried to avoid it in the book, is to think of more recent East and West divides, perceptions right. in the West of what the East is like and all this sort of thing. While some of these things have drawn upon Greek and Roman traditions, it is much more different. You know, we, we, we often tend to forget that a large part of Greek culture comes not from Greece, but from Turkey, from yeah. Syria, from Asia, right. you know, Asia right. Minor, that area, from Egypt, you know, Alexandria right. in Egypt. And Absolutely. a lot of the Roman Empire, the empire that lasts so long into the 15th century, is this Eastern Empire that's Greek-speaking. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, so you have aspects of, you know, there's the Western European tradition that had dominated later on, but it's come through a slightly different route. Um, I think the the interesting thing to me was the the sense of restraint about it all on both sides. Mm. 
we look, we tend to think of civil these are expansionist empires, therefore they will keep on expanding and they'll destroy themselves if they can't expand. Well, that's not true. Neither Rome nor the Parthians, Persians, they reach a point where they don't keep adding territory and they still go on for century after century and they're still highly successful for a long time and they fight each other, but there seems to be this self-imposed restraint. Um, you know, something I, I highlight a little bit in the, the introduction and conclusion is that we've we've developed this perception, and I think it's partly because of the world wars, particularly the Second World War, that you fight a war until that enemy is destroyed and they're not there anymore. Mm. Most of human history is actually about the same states fighting each other again and again, generation after generation, but for fairly small gains. Mm. You know, they they do quite well for a bit, they take some territory, they get some prestige. And they don't, but they don't try and overwhelm and conquer the other all the time because that's rarely possible. They don't have enough of an advantage. So I think there's there's an element where we can sometimes forget there, there is always a danger that when you look at history, you just look at recent history or a few bits. And one of the advantages of the ancient world is that you go to these different cultures, these different ways of thinking about things. And I've tried here, I mean, this was a lot of this was a, a learning experience for me. I'd never thought so much about the Parthians and the Persians. Mm. And when you start to try and see the world from their point of view and their advantage and this this regime, rather than I'm more familiar with, you know, I've written more about the Romans in the past, you see them differently, but you also see the Romans differently. And you realize that some of these ideas about, you know, there's the Roman poets will always celebrate their empire and power without limit. Well, clearly they do accept in practical terms a limit a lot of the time. They are, there seems it, it's a very odd mixture. I think it, it's there's a humanity about the story because you see again and again individual ambitions will distort a picture that on the whole they try and keep balance and they try and keep the peace with each other. But then it's convenient for a particular ruler to go to war. He does so. But it's this sort of mixture of very rational calculation and a sense that actually it's probably in our interest for this other empire to be there because it's easier to deal with them than fragmented groups that are so unpredictable. But we just need to sort of make sure we're strong compared to them. We feel good about ourselves and all this sort of thing. But then suddenly someone can decide, well, actually, I think they're vulnerable. I'm going to fight a war, even though I know it's it's one I can't win a big victory, but I can win a victory that will satisfy me. Mm. So that sense of sort of self-imposed restraint, but also... And the other thing, the other big thing, and this is something, again, perhaps it's it's come from, in my case, growing up in the Cold War, but you still feel lots of people assume they will talk about the world as if it, it has the same assumptions as our particular country. So from a Western perspective, from you know US and NATO perspective, we'll say, well, are they for us or against us? Instead of looking at, well, they're really for themselves, and it might suit their purpose to be friends with us or oppose us. And that's not necessarily a consistent thing in every aspect of what they're doing. You know, it's it's reminding ourselves that the people in the middle, the Armenians, the um, the different kingdoms, the Arab groups that were here, they've all got their own their own agendas, their own ambitions, their own desires, their own fears. Yeah. And just because they're not as big as the great empire doesn't mean that locally they can't be really, really important. Mm-hmm. Um, and a major factor, and that also, you know, the, the time and time again, when a war will start between the two empires because it suited the advantages of an Armenian king or a kingdom of one of the other client uh, areas or one of these other independent, semi-independent, allied to both sides, more or less, and frequently they're fighting each other. You know, and it's clearly not under the central direction of the main authority of the main empire. So it's it's a reminder of the complexity mm. that. It's so easy. We always see things from you know where we our starting point, where we're looking out, yeah. and we forget that everybody's doing that. Mm-hmm. It's just, but they're from different places and and different assumptions. So so I think that's the sort of it's it's a reminder really of how history works and how current politics and diplomacy and competition works. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that's what makes the book so good is is trying to see the kind of different perspectives and vantage points from the the, the Roman side and the Persian side. So it's that's what. I think where it really soars. Um, well, the book's called Rome and Persia, the 700 year rivalry. This is uh, through the wonderful basic books and it's out in September and you can get it everywhere. Uh, Adrian, this was too much fun. This was too much Thanks, fun. I would just try to absorb all of the information and the knowledge you were giving. It's fantastic. 
the book is wonderful. Uh, so I'm super happy about it for you for, for the book coming out. And I can't say enough thanks for your your time and your energy. Uh, big, big, big thanks. Well, thanks for having me again. It's, it's, uh, I, I like talking about history, as you may have noticed. So I'm always happy to do that. <laughs> yes, of course. Uh, big, big thanks. And um, I, uh, I look forward to uh, for, for all the listeners being able to hear it.